Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Paweł Mdemski. I'm director of the Polish Institute of International Affairs and uh, one of the co editors of, uh, of this book, Europe, uh, Holland Free Vision and Reality, together with Dan Hamilton, who is another um, editor of, of this uh, book. And I would like to welcome Dan uh, today again. Um, um, Dan is uh, a president of Transatlantic Leadership Network, but also professor of um, the Austrian Marshall Plan uh, Foundation at Johns Hopkins University. Um, when he runs also Foreign Policy Institute of United States, Europe and the World Order program uh, at this university. But uh, as I said, most importantly, Dan is co-editor of this uh, already famous book, I believe. Or the famous. Um, um, uh, Dan was also a, a US diplomat in the times when um, the great vision of, uh, of uh, Europe whole and free and at peace um, was uh, well uh, tried to be implemented. Um, so he has he has a first hand knowledge about the perception of Europe in that time in the 90s, uh, and also uh, what is very important in the context of uh, in the context of today's conversation, uh, how Russia was perceived, what expectations uh, um, um, towards Russia were are uh, you know uh, dominated uh, minds of of uh, U.S. and European decision makers. Uh, we have also, uh, and that's a, a great honor uh, for us, Andrei Kortunov, one of the contributors to this, uh, to this book, <laughs> who is um, a director general of, of the Russian uh, International Affairs Council. Uh, uh, also in the 90s, he spent uh, years <coughs> building bridges over troubled waters between the uh, uh, well, at the beginning, Soviet Union, then Russia and the West. Um, he was one of the liberals uh, or liberal experts pushing uh, towards um, uh, dialogue and uh, more understanding between, you know, uh, these two worlds in, in the changing international context in the time in, in the 90s. So, uh, um, Andrei contributed uh, to our book um, uh, an article entitled "How Can Russia Get Back to Europe?" and that's 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 going to be a subject of it to today's conversation. Before we go, uh, I have some technical remarks. Uh, so I would like to to remind all our uh, followers that uh, this conversation is also broadcasted via Peace and Facebook and Twitter accounts. So uh, you can follow both of them. Um, if you are watching us on YouTube, uh, we invite you to subscribe to our account and click on the, the bell button. So you will always know uh, when we publish new uh, video content live on the recorded. During the debate, you can also ask our uh, questions to the speakers. Uh, to do so, please use the comment section next to your YouTube video feed. Um, feel free to do the, the same on, on Facebook and Twitter. And this debate is part of the series. We will continue with the authors of Europe, Poland and Free Vision and Reality book. So stay tuned for more interesting discussions. Um, and also, uh, please feel free to read Andrei Kortunov's essay from, from the book, which is available on our PISM website, um, www.pism.pl. So, um, uh, to uh, cut the, the, the longest story short, I would like to uh, turn um, uh, to Andrei, uh, with the first question, which uh, should be a kind of the kickoff question for our discussion. Andre made quite controversial point in his article. He said that uh, in, you know, uh, today, uh, in, to in 2020, uh, Russia is closer to Europe than it used to be in 1989. Um, um, 
Today, of course, we, uh, we lived in, in the circumstances when uh, Russia is a subject of, of, of sanctions uh, due to uh, um, aggressive, its aggressive policy towards Ukraine, annexation of Crimea and, 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 and uh, Donbass. So uh, today, this kind of, the po this kind of point uh, sounds really controversial. Andre, the floor is yours. Why do you think so? That you know, <laughs> why we are closer to Russia uh, now than we than in 1989, when this vision was, uh, uh, you know, uh, expressed uh, by the uh, President of the United States in at Mainz, uh, uh, in end of May, uh, and Russia was the main uh, um, actor, main contributor to this vision. Um, so. Why we? Why I do you think so, Andrzej, The floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you, Slavomir. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm really very grateful uh, for an opportunity to see you and uh, to see Dan, uh, and uh, to be back to my younger years. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, that uh, our contacts will uh, continue, uh, despite uh, all the uh, challenging circumstances that we have to confront. Uh, and uh, responding to your question, uh, I have to tell you that I'm old enough uh, to remember the Soviet years. And uh, I uh, can say, and I think uh, with personal experience, that indeed uh, the Soviet Union was, uh, even during the perestroika years, was much more remote from Europe than Russia today. Uh, and uh, I think that we Russians, Russian citizens, the Russian society are much more European today than we were 30 years ago. And let me illustrate that with a couple of uh, uh, points. First of all, uh, Russia mu now much more depends on Europe than the Soviet Union depended on Europe uh, 30 years ago in the economic sense. With all the sanctions and uh, counter sanctions notwithstanding, you know, with all the Asian pivot notwithstanding this uh, drive to rely more on China, still the facts are that the European Union remains the largest trading partner of the Russian Federation, more than 40% of the overall trade. Uh, it is by far the largest investor into the Russian Federation. And I would also say that uh, it is the main source of new technologies uh, of uh, corporate culture, uh, and uh, even of social models. When they think about any project, like for example, the Eurasian Economic Union, the first model which uh, they think of is of course uh, the European Union. So economically, I think uh, it cannot be denied that uh, Europe is much more important for Russia today than it was uh, for the Soviet Union 30 years ago. Now, in terms of the information exchange, again, you see a dramatically different situation today. I recall 30 years ago, it was impossible uh, to get access to a single European newspaper, probably ex except for Morning Star paper of uh, British communists. Uh, but uh, today you can get uh, any European newspaper, any book published uh, uh, in Europe and uh, definitely uh, European lifestyles are much more common in Russia than they were in the Soviet Union. You go to the downtown of Moscow and uh, probably you will not trace a lot of difference between Moscow and Warsaw or, or London or, or, or Paris. I think that Moscow, St. Petersburg, major metropolitan areas uh, in the Russian Federation uh, have become much more cosmopolitan and in a way uh, much more uh, European. Now, if you take the humanitarian interaction between Russia and Europe, again, you see a tremendous progress over the last 30 years. The Soviet Union was a closed society. I think that uh, in the Soviet Union, only 400,000 people uh, carried foreign passports. Uh, in Russia today, millions of people travel abroad. And of course, the major magnet uh, is not Iran or Venezuela, uh, it is still uh, countries of the European Union. Uh, we have a lot of uh, trans-border communication, many successful projects uh, with EU member states, 
uh, we definitely have large diasporas practically in every European country. Uh, if uh, a wealthy Russian is thinking about uh, where he or she would uh, like to send his or her kids to study, it is Europe. It is not Asia, it's not Middle East, uh, it's not even North America. Uh, you see that uh, most of Russians are looking at European universities for quality education, uh, for joint projects, uh, and uh, maybe for further employment. So I think that uh, if you take the social dimension and uh, to a large extent uh, the economic dimension, uh, definitely Russia is uh, much more European today uh, than it was uh, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, they talk a lot uh, about the gap in values, but again, if you take uh, an ordinary Russian citizen uh, and uh, if you are talking about personal values, uh, like uh, consumption models, uh, like uh, career expectations, like lifestyles, fashion. I think that uh, definitely the gap which existed uh, between the Soviet Union uh, or the communist bloc at large uh, and the rest of Europe 30 years ago is no longer there. Now, having said that, I don't want to, uh, to portray a very rosy picture. I think that uh, we failed uh, in what I would call uh, the institutional integration of Russia into Europe. Because the challenge that we all had to confront 30 years ago was how to get Russia at the table, to the table, uh, without uh, giving Russia veto power on major European questions. Uh, and institutionally, we tried a couple of models, and uh, I elaborate a little bit uh, on these models in my chapter, but none of them worked. Uh, we tried uh, to start with pan-European uh, organizations and institutions, the Charter of Paris and OSCE. It didn't work for a variety of reasons. Uh, we tried uh, to get Russia some kind of special status, special affiliation to major European institutions, the NATO Russia Council or four spaces with the European Union uh, and the so-called roadmaps. Uh, it didn't work either. Uh, then we tried uh, to create something like a uh, two-legged Europe based uh, on uh, institutions in the West and in the East. Uh, and we thought that probably the European Union would find a partner uh, in uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, <coughs> that NATO would probably <coughs> be tempted to cooperate with, the, with CSTO, this uh, uh, collective security treaty organization. It didn't work either. So institutionally, we failed. And I think that um, another failure, and uh, as a person who spent most of his professional life working with Europeans, I feel particularly frustrated about that. Uh, Europe is no longer the magnet. It is no longer the center of gravity. Because 30 years ago, we could have disputes among ourselves about the paths of modernization. Should we go faster? Should we go slower? Should we keep some elements of authoritarianism or should we uh, go into full-fledged democracy? But uh, we didn't have these agreements on the point of destination. Uh, and this point was, of course, Europe. It was a European uh, liberal model uh, with a social state, uh, with the market economy, uh, with uh, political pluralism. Uh, Europe was an incarnation, the incarnation of modernity. And it's no longer the case uh, for a variety of reasons, which we can discuss. I think uh, partially it's because uh, Russia too failed, uh, failed to uh, endorse and to accept this model, partially because in Europe itself, this model is challenged today more than it was 30 years ago. So in this sense, it is a failure. And uh, these 30 years uh, are not a success story, but still, I insist uh, on my view that uh, Russia is much more European today than it was 30 years ago. Thank you very much. A uh, very brief comment. I believe that, that what you are, are outlined here uh, is rather that Russians are much more integrated uh, in Europe culturally, um, you know, by, by social networks, but not necessarily Russia is. So uh, this leads me to, to uh, Dan. Um, 
who actually uh, was was uh, partially responsible for you know uh, um, advancing Europe uh, whole and free in in in, in the nineties. You know, in the, in the, as a diplomat, as a US diplomat, uh, trying to, uh, uh, to to shape a new world order after 1989. So, uh, Dan, my you know initial question to you would be, uh, how uh, what expectations uh, in that time were uh, about about Russia, and what you know uh, how you how how can you assess? Uh, uh, if, uh, you know the way uh, we we managed to to travel uh, during the last thirty years. Where we are, and uh, can what can we say about about you know Russia's contribution to the to the Europe Holland Free now? Well, thank you, Savmir, and thanks to Andre. It's great to be here uh, with everyone. I think uh, you just made the important distinction <clears throat> between Russians and Russia. Uh, and I think that goes back to 1989. I, I mean, I agree with Andre's premise if he means Russia's society. Uh, uh, and if we think about it, 1989, Russian society and European societies were trying to come to e closer to each other. It was an amazing dynamic. In fact, it was the people on the streets, really, that were driving a lot of this you know, finding each other again. Uh, governments were struggling to catch up, frankly. Uh, even Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, you know, was, events were outpacing his own ability to, uh, you know, make that change. But I think the Soviet state at that time, as it was dissolved, just, be, you know, in the last years of its existence, was also reaching to Europe. That was the whole premise of Gorbachev's effort was to anchor the Soviet Union to sort of reform socialism, if you will, and to have this whole uh, European partner. That's partially why he agreed to German unification, that you could lock Germany into a predictable set of relationships and harness German power to uh, help uh, the Soviet Union modernize. Uh, I think, you know, he turned out to be the sorcerer's apprentice rather than the sorcerer in the end, Gorbachev. But there's no denying the dynamic of the time was that both society and the state were trying to come together uh, across the East-West divide. Now, now I think, I think uh, Andre's point, I, I would agree with that, that at a societal level, Russians are very uh, much more attuned to dynamics in Europe and there's much easier, except for now, of course, with the pandemic, but usually much easier back and forth. And uh, you notice that when you're in Russia, it's just a very different sort of dynamic that one can see, especially if you're someone like me also who lived during the Soviet mm -hmm. times and remember these differences. But the real difference as the state now is not reaching across to create something new. Under Vladimir Putin, the state is standing back. Uh, and I think that's a big, big distinction. If we think about what also was going on in 1989, it was a time of pervasive uncertainty. It's easy now to say, oh, well, all that just happened. Uh, mm. I mean, no one knew what was gonna happen the, the next day. Uh, and the danger that this could all go bad and that turn violent, which it did in some places, was uppermost on people's minds. Um, and I think one, one thing to remember, of course, it was the Soviet Union that we we're talking about, which then dissolved into many, many countries. At about the same time that Yugoslavia also dissolved into different countries so that, you know, at that time in those couple of years, suddenly more than 20 new states, new countries uh, were born on the European continent. And we had to understand how to manage that process. I think frankly, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and all of that went relatively well. It was relatively peaceful. We did a horrible job 
managing the dissolution of Yugoslavia. Uh, we denied that it was our problem. Europe thought you could handle it, it couldn't. Uh, we finally had to work together also with Russia in the end, despite many problems, to try to put that part of Europe back on some track. And one has to remember our uppermost concern then was not the state to state competition, but was the dissolution of states and what could have happened if things had gone really badly. I think today, com compared to that concern, despite, again, issues that we have, that's not the preeminent concern right now. It is back to the state to state competition. Um, and there we are just facing the issue that under Vladimir Putin, Russia has decided that it's not, you know, it's, I guess, here's the way I would phrase it. it we had a paradigm, at least in the West, that there would be just a gradual um, magnetic Western-led order that would gradually be expanding, including other countries in its orbit, and that Russia at some point would find its place. As Andre said, we didn't have the, you know, figure out the right mechanisms, but that was the trajectory. Uh, and I think what we realize is now Russia's not sort of under Putin, not lost in transition somewhere. It is going its own way. Uh, it is not stuck somewhere. We are stuck now in our own conversation with each other and we're talking past each other much of the time at the governmental uh, level. And, and those views on both sides are rooted in just very different perceptions and oriented very different interests and goals uh, that make it you know, hard to say that we, our relations are closer. In fact, at the state level, you could argue relations are their worst since Gorbachev. Uh, so there's this really big dichotomy between the intersocietal connections that we see and the state-to-state -state competition uh, that is, if anything, uh, you know, become more uh, dramatic. Mm. Yes. Uh, uh, this brings me to, to, the, to the, the next question. Uh, Andre said that uh, all three attempts to shape institutionally um, uh, relations between Europe and Russia, Soviet Union uh, first and then Russia failed. So my, my question to, to both of you would be uh, to Andrei, uh, what were internal domestic Russian factors which contributed to, to this failure? Uh, and to Dan, uh, there, there is a long and intensive debate uh, 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 Going on about who is, you know, who is to be to be blamed for for, for the fact that we we lost Russia somehow uh, in 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 this process. Definitely, uh, uh, in May 1989, the message of U.S. President uh, was addressed to Mikhail Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, there was invitation uh, to the Soviet Union to to contribute to this new world order. Um, based on the principle of, of democracy, I would say, because, you know, Perestroika and Glasnost, all these great notions which uh, changed Russia and all the Soviet Union uh, um, um, uh, very much, uh, were in fact based on, on, on notions of democracy. So uh, oh, how do you feel about this, you know, uh, uh, West, uh, or Western contribution to, to this uh, three failures mentioned by, by, by but, but first uh, the floor and all screen goes to Andre. Uh, what, what were, you know, uh, um, domestic factors which contributed to this, this failure? Well, of course, uh, you can refer to many developments uh, uh, inside Russia, uh, which uh, defined uh, this change. Uh, one of the most apparent uh, uh, reasons was probably <clears throat> many mistakes and blunders uh, committed in 1990s. And these mistakes and blunders uh, clearly to a large extent discredited uh, the transition towards a mature democracy. And uh, the mere term democracy 
has acquired uh, almost derogatory meaning. At least Democrat is not something that uh, uh, you can uh, proudly associate yourself with. Uh, and uh, uh, definitely we still, uh, I think, pay the price uh, for the mistakes committed 20, 25, 30 years ago. And uh, many uh, in the Russian leadership uh, still refer to 1990s as a nightmare, uh, as something that uh, we should try to avoid, uh, no matter what uh, cost uh, it might entail. Uh, but uh, I would say in my view, and uh, here uh, I, I think that uh, it uh, might be manifestation of uh, my uh, uh, Marxist education, uh, but I think that economic factors are really very important here uh, because uh, <clears throat> I think one of the failures of the Russian transformation was a failure <coughs> to gradually cultivate <coughs> and promote a strong middle class. Middle class that would be independent from state that would be a source of social innovation and that would create uh, an important constituency of stakeholders interested uh, in uh, building strong relations with the West. If you take, for example, our relations with Germany, these relations are very important, but uh, most of this relationship economically is limited uh, to a very limited number of large and super large projects like energy. That doesn't constitute a social network, social tissue of the relationship, unfortunately. So I think that uh, economic uh, reform failures and their social implications uh, were probably the most important factor which uh, uh, didn't allow us to prevent a backlash. Because, you know, in all uh, post-communist countries, there was a kind of backlash, you know. Social democratic governments uh, replaced uh, liberal governments, uh, and uh, it was a bumpy road uh, for many of our Western neighbors. However, uh, for them, uh, it was not a decisive turn. Uh, and I think this is uh, the uh, most important differences. And uh, that uh, implies that Russia will get back to Europe only uh, if and when Russia is getting serious about structural economic reforms, uh, which will generate uh, new constituencies of stakeholders interested uh, in uh, better relations uh, with the West, especially uh, with the European Union, since I think uh, that in this sense, uh, the United States is of less importance uh, for Russia uh, than Europe. Uh, on the other hand, uh, let me also say that, of course, uh, President Putin was very lucky that uh, his uh, uh, first term in power uh, coincided uh, with the very rapid uh, rise of oil prices uh, so basically the government uh, got the opportunity not to bother with painful reforms and uh, to rely on oil revenues. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, we should not forget uh, uh, that the West itself uh, 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 today is not as confident uh, uh, in the universality of the liberal, liberal paradigm as it was 20 years ago. And I think that this is something that didn't uh, go unnoticed in Moscow. Uh, Dan, uh, now, now your turn. What, what, we, what we did wrong uh, in terms of, you know, in our policy towards Russia. Well, Thank uh, you. So, and, and Sami, you should also join this conversation with your own views, of course. Um, well, I would agree with Andre that I think the 90s were seen in Russia as a real mess, and in many ways they were domestically. I think the challenge for us is that some Russian elites 
conflated that domestic transition and all its problems with Russia's international relationships and tend to equate the mess, if you will, or the disaster, also a disaster because Russia tried to work with the West. And so that, that turning away from the 1990s, unfortunately, uh, meant turning away from both of the domestic reforms and the international links. And frankly, I think during the 1990s, there was a lot done, mainly by Europe, mainly by Germany, frankly, to work with Russia on modernization. Uh, the United States didn't play that much of a role. It did mainly through, you know, advisors and things, but it didn't, it didn't play that role. And, I, and unfortunately, I think that didn't work out. Uh, and under Putin, I have to say, you know, Russia, Russia, if you think about it, is a very rich country. Uh, but Putin has, you know, for reasons of his own, decided never to turn Russia's wealth into, you know, efforts to create that kind of social contract that Andre is talking about, or to address the stunning demographic and health challenges the country faces, to simply get away from this energy, you know, raw material dependent economy and to broaden the base of the economy, which I agree is really going to be the only way forward that will be sustainable. It's really how Russia defines its greatness, whether, whether it's the greatness of its society and its economy and its people, or whether it is to be a, a great power in the you know, old Yalta sense of, of the word. And unfortunately, I think Putin has decided the latter. So uh, we all have made mistakes, and I think one should, you know, go through that briefly if I if I can. I, I do think, however, and that runs through our book that uh, NATO, you know, NATO's open door to countries is pictured often in the Russian uh, accounts of all this. What went wrong is sort of the you know the answer. It's all based on that. Uh, and I think that's just a false uh, reading of history uh, in that in the 90s, if the record will show that the United States and its allies made an extraordinary effort to reach out to Russia as a partner and even an ally when the Cold War ended and, and, and frankly, up until about 2014. Um, and that there were other things going on besides this issue that really played a role. I think... Uh, if one just recalls briefly, when the United States was attacked after September 11th, 2001, I think Putin and, and many saw that attack as an opportunity again to reestablish a new relationship with the West. The initial Russian reaction was that of solidarity. It was to cut, let's come together. And if you re remember, NATO and Russia created a whole new way of working together that did herald maybe something new. Um, and it's interesting to say, you know, when the Baltic states were admitted to NATO just after that, there was no, you know, negative reaction from Russia. Uh, in fact, Russia continued to reduce its forces along its Western flank, even when all that was going on. So at the time, it just, there was no sense that this was, you know, this type of issue. We realized Russians didn't like it, but it wasn't the reason why Russia turned away. I do think the Iraq war in 2003 uh, rekindled Russian objections to this idea of, you know, US launched operations without Security Council mandate. Uh, the Kosovo issue had been a, a problem, but in the end, Russian diplomats helped resolve the Kosovo problem. Uh, so Russia was part of that. I think the Bush administrations, and this frankly is where Poland is involved, I think the Bush administration pursuit of ballistic missile defense, uh, uh, including this third site idea, even though it wasn't, couldn't possibly deal you know, with the Russian uh, nuclear capabilities, the way the narrative was framed was, could have been done better, let's put it that way. And it just awakened more suspicions I think the one that really did in the Russians was the Bush's decision to withdraw from the ABM treaty. Because the whole premise of strategic stability at the time had been, you know, the crazy mutually assured destruction 
with an all based on offense and no defense. And suddenly you change the basic calculus of your nuclear arrangements, uh, that, that's unsettling. And I can understand we w should have had you know, much closer discussion about that. But I think what really changed the Putin calculus is then the, you know, the, or re the rose and the orange revolutions in Georgia and Ukraine in the sense that somehow the West was steering these things, whether they really believed it or not, I, I can't say, but at least they were used to frame a narrative that somehow the West was you know, seeking regime change in Moscow also, and that those color revolutions were you know, special ops kinds of uh, operations aimed at under, undermining Russia's, not only Russia's interest in, in its near abroad, as it calls it, but maybe even at home. Um, I think there was, which again, wasn't noticed in the West, a wave of terrorist attacks in Russia uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, and for some reason, I don't have any reason to believe it's true. Putin seemed to think the United States had some hand in some of that. Uh, so we could go on and on. And I think finally the Arab Spring, the intervention in Libya, again, was another example where Putin saw the U.S. sort of acting without, as he would think, proper legitimacy. We could go on. The point yeah. is there are lots of issues. None of them, none of that had to do with NATO enlargement. It's just not, it's not part of the conversation. The other ones are all legitimate points of contention, but it's not, it's not the NATO issue. So I think we should, you know, let, let, if we're going to assign blame to each other, uh, which we can do, let's have that type of discussion of miscues and miscommunications, uh, but it's not the one that a lot of people point to. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. We, we have a first question uh, uh, to Andrzej from Agnieszka Legutska, um, Russian analyst in the, the Polish Institute of, of International Affairs, uh, an analyst working on Russia. Uh, um, Agnieszka asks, um, the following um, uh, question. Andre said that Russia is more European, but maybe it means that it's more capitalist country uh, ever before. Uh, but it, uh, does it mean European in the sense? Um, I would uh, elaborate a bit, you know, in the following vein, um, um, because there is a, there is a, um, um, a famous Gleb Pawłowski point made in, in his one of the recent uh, books, I think the one published in uh, 2014, that after 1989, the history um, ended for Russia differently than for the West. Um, the, the lessons, uh, uh, that's uh, Pawłowski's point, and the lessons uh, uh, um, uh, Russia's elite drawn from, from the collapse of Soviet Union was not, you know, that uh, now we would live in, in the liberal democracy uh, paradigm, that the values would create a kind of the uh, um, uh, room for all of us uh, uh, to live in. Uh, but for, for the Russian elite, um, the message was that actually uh, no ideology uh, would, uh, would matter uh, um, any longer, that values are, you know, just a tool for, you know, pushing the, you know, uh, foreign policy interests of other countries. Um, so uh, it, was a, it was a kind of the um, a very um, sceptic, I would say, mood towards a uh, Western liberal world, even then, in even 1989. So, uh, Andrzej, uh, where, you know, uh, uh, how, how you could, where, where you can put Russia now? Is it, is it simply just a cynical uh, capitalist country um, oriented only in, you know, um, uh, it's, it's uh, well-being or well-being of citizens uh, described or identified only in terms of, of you know, um, richness. Uh, or uh, it is a country which, which uh, lost itself in transition uh, in, in the way, as uh, Dan also uh, suggested. 
Well, it's a very good question, and I should probably correct my initial uh, uh, statement. Uh, uh, we uh, should probably distinguish uh, between uh, what I would call westernization of Russia and uh, its Europeanization. Uh, Russia has become much more westernized over the last uh, 30 years. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, uh, it's not necessarily the process of uh, becoming a part of the European family. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, Europe is about the West, but Europe is not only about the West. It is also about something different. Uh, it is different from the United States. It is different uh, from capitalist systems in East Asia. Uh, so Europe has uh, uh, a number of very specific features. Uh, I don't want to say that uh, Russia is opposed to Europe in this sense. Yes, for example, you can say that socially, uh, Russia is uh, much more used uh, than uh, the United Kingdom uh, to a paternalistic social contract. Uh, but uh, paternalistic social contract is something which is very common, let's say, in Southern Europe, not in the North, not in the Protestant Europe, but uh, at least in the part of the Catholic Europe. Uh, Russia uh, is uh, definitely closer to Hungary uh, than uh, it is uh, to Portugal these days. Uh, but uh, uh, definitely uh, we can argue uh, that uh, there is a gap in values. Uh, and I would go even further. I would say that uh, you can even question, you know, how capitalist the country is these days. Uh, state is back to the economy. And now at least 30, at least 70 percent of the Russian population uh, directly or indirectly uh, receive their salaries from state. Uh, it's unbelievable, you know, compared to what we had uh, uh, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, uh, there is a, a process of renationalization of uh, uh, public uh, wealth. And uh, definitely that happens to the detriment of the private sector. Uh, I don't, want, I don't uh, know to what extent uh, the definitions of the 20th century can be applied uh, uh, to what we witness now in the world. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that what we see in Russia uh, is not just a deviation from the classical liberal democracy, but also a clear deviation from the classical uh, market economy. I think that, that that cannot be denied. State is uh, becoming more and more powerful, and the private sector uh, is being uh, marginalized more and more so. So in this sense, uh, uh, I would uh, probably agree uh, that uh, Russia is not as uh, European as it could have been or as it should have been, uh, given the opportunities that uh, we saw uh, 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 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, however, having said that, uh, I think that it's impossible for Russia uh, to switch, for example, from Europe to Asia. It's impossible to imitate the Chinese model because uh, the, the social structure, the demographic structure, the level of urbanization, the educational level uh, makes Russia still much uh, closer to its uh, Western neighbors than to its Eastern neighbors. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, uh, cannot be changed. So when they're talking about values uh, and when they argue that uh, Russia is different from Europe, I just wonder uh, what kind of values uh, uh, do they have in mind? Uh, for example, they say that uh, Russia stands uh, for conservative uh, religious values. But uh, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, Pew Foundation uh, analysis of the level of religiosity, of course, Russia is inferior to Poland by all standards. Uh, when they talk about family values, the level of uh, divorces in Russia is not that different uh, from the level of divorces uh, in uh, most of European countries. Uh, you, may, you may take uh, any other uh, major uh, practical uh, indicators uh, of uh, social values, and you will not see that uh, many differences. Russia is different from Iran in this sense, in terms of family, in terms of religion, but it is not that different from European nations. Again, you know, I don't want to, uh, to bring Russia closer to Europe, 
But I think that uh, when we are talking about values, uh, we should be a little bit more precise about what we mean uh, and what specific set of values we have in mind. Uh, okay, we have we have one additional question to, to um, both of you, and maybe I will, I will also comment on, on that uh, as the last one. Uh, and we have uh, something like 11 minutes to go. Um, uh, under what conditions Russia can be, uh, you know, can be get back to, to, to Europe? And what kind of Russia it, it, it could be? So uh, maybe, uh, you know, I will ask Dan first to, to uh, you know, uh, uh, to respond to this kind of question. How we can get Russia back to Europe and under what conditions? I do. I mean, I really do defer to Andre because I think the answer to that is it's really up to Russia. Uh, I don't think there's something particularly that we could be doing that would change that path if there's no fundamental decision in Russia to go down that path. So I really do uh, defer. As I said, if Russian leaders would decide to use their immense wealth of their society to create the kind of new social contract that Andre is mentioning, that in itself would start a process of getting closer to Europe not because of foreign policy action, just because of the nature of what that would imply. So that is, uh, that's certainly one thing that would happen. I think the other is, again, if you just think about it, how Russia relates to its, all of the which are smaller neighbors, uh, it, again, back to how it defines its greatness. I've always been struck, I have the same question always for my Russian friends and I always get the same answer over 30 years, you know, which is, what's better for Russia to have a band of prosperous, secure, weaker, you know, neighbors along its periphery, uh, but ones that are uh, smaller, but, you know, secure, or to have a band of fragile, you know, uh, turbulent countries that are uh, in a state of dissolution. And I always get the answer is uh, this, the latter uh, is in Russia's interests. I mean, I, as long as the answer is the latter, the second part of that, I think uh, it's gonna be hard for Russia to come back to Europe because there are lots of countries in between. Uh, and they, the question is, what about them? Uh, we have to understand that whole in-between space is still a really, really important part of the answer to this question. Yes, that's that's a very important point. Of course, it opens the question whether we should uh, be more open for the countries in between uh, to become a you know part of, of you know Western slash European institutions. Maybe that could create a magnet for the Russians. At least there is a, such an argument in the debate, or has been in in, the, in debate uh, about uh, the future of Eastern Europe. Um, so, Andre, uh, uh, the screen is yours. Well, uh, first of all, let me say that, <clears throat> in my view, uh, the Russian choice is not uh, about uh, geography. Uh, it's uh, not about uh, uh, Europe or Asia, about uh, the European Union or China. Uh, the challenge is more fundamental. <laughs> it, <coughs> I think... <coughs> I think that it is a choice between isolationism and integration, between unilateralism and multilateralism, uh, between soft power and hard power, uh, between nationalism and internationalism. It's about the attitude towards the world. Uh, will Russians consider the world uh, as a threat, as a challenge, or rather as an opportunity? And I think this is the most fundamental question for Russia, maybe not only for Russia, as we see right now, many, question, many countries have the same dilemma. Uh, in terms of uh, when Russia, if Russia gets back to Europe, uh, I think that uh, there are three preconditions, if I might say so. First of all, I already mentioned, and let me emphasize it once again, 
Russia will need Europe if and when Russia takes the issue of structural reform seriously. If Russia decides to get off the oil needle to unleash the creative potential of the Russian people to promote uh, uh, industry 4.0 economy, uh, if Russia is uh, serious about entering this new stage in the te technological development, there is no substitute to Europe. China is important, the United States is important, but Europe is critical. So I think that uh, a lot will depend uh, on how Russia defines uh, its uh, economic and technological future. Second, uh, let me second uh, Dan. I think it's really very important to change the narrative about what makes Russia great or important or respectful. And uh, I think that that was one of the mistakes that we did in 1990s because we didn't care about self-esteem, about identity. We thought that uh, if we had values, that was enough, but it is not enough. Uh, and uh, here, Russia is clearly different from, let us say, Poland, because uh, Poland uh, could join Europe uh, on the basis of triumphant nationalism. Russia couldn't do that. And I think that uh, here we failed, and uh, this is uh, one of the important uh, lessons uh, uh, to be learned. And finally, uh, let me say that, of course, uh, Russia can join Europe uh, if there is anything left to join. Because uh, if uh, the European Union, sorry to say that, but if the Union goes down the drain, uh, if it becomes weaker, it, if it becomes more fragmented, if it becomes less attractive as a model, as a partner, uh, definitely we have a problem in Russia. Uh, because our opponents will say, you know, why do you want to join these losers? Uh, they are going to, uh, to, to, to disappear from the geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, map of the world pretty soon. So basically, it is really important for us uh, back in Russia uh, to see the European Union and Europe at large uh, uh, as a prosperous, uh, stable, and attractive place. Because if it is not the case, uh, I think that uh, many, not just in Russia, but many neighboring countries, uh, including Ukraine or you know, Kazakhstan, or whatever, uh, they will definitely uh, have their positions uh, significantly weakened. Thank you very much. Uh, I, believe, I believe that both of you uh, um, contributed uh, um, greatly to this uh, debate. I, I agree that, uh, to some extent, um, uh, the question how Russia can and how and when Russia can, can get back to Europe depends on first uh, Russians themselves. So, if the structural reforms about about uh, which uh, um, Andre is talking um, uh, about, you know, uh, that Russia goes this way, that's the first precondition. Second. I think, you know, uh, a very important uh, dance point that um, it would require a redefinition of greatness of Russia. Um, uh, because, you know, w w without that, uh, the notion of, um, of um, self-regulating uh, um, uh, political system uh, uh, would be perceived as a, still as a threat. Yeah. Uh, okay. And without, and you know, uh, uh, um, and if if the decision is made that that uh, Russia would need this self-regulating political system, uh, uh, it automatically uh, would open the doors for uh, you know uh, negotiations or discussions with Ukrainians automatically, because uh, without the solving of of uh, constraints and troubles and problems in uh, Russian-Ukrainian relations, uh, uh, very little can be done in the relations of, you know, changing uh, uh, the paradigm of Russian foreign policy. That's the kind of the litmus paper, uh, um, both for the Russians themselves, for Ukrainians, for the outside world. Uh, so go, the, the, the road to Europe uh, goes through uh, Kiev, uh, in my view, in that sense.
But also, I, I agree with Dan that Europe should do something to restore its magnet. I mean, to restore its uh, power of, uh, um, of you know, uh, absorbing uh, uh, those willing to live uh, according to the standards and norms uh, uh, provided by the European integration. Um, uh, and of course, there is a question of leadership uh, of the United States somewhere there. Um, and uh, United States also uh, um, would need to go through the process of uh, redefining uh, and, and themselves to restore its, its uh, leadership role in the free world. Um, I think that all, all of all of these are, are subject and questions, um, um, you know, creates a, a great invitation for all of us to uh, to rejoin in the uh, in the following uh, debates uh, mm -hmm. about the book of uh, Europe, Holland, Free. Uh, we we cannot we cannot uh, you know. Um, discuss all issues. Uh, uh, so brilliantly uh, uh, encapsulated in this book, I encourage all of our, uh, all of our followers and listeners and uh, readers to uh, to read it. And I would like to thank uh, um, Andre and Dan for being with us uh, today, and invite all of you uh, following uh, these debates on on our uh, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, YouTube uh, accounts to be with us uh, during the next uh, discussions about the book chapters and and international uh, system which is shaking now. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you very much, Dan, and Thank see you, you uh, see you soon. Stay well. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye, you. Andy.